Well, hello and welcome to YouTube. Mr. Robinson back here with yet another brand new exciting video on MathBase, of course. And as always, it is an honor and a privilege to be serving you today as it is every day here in my virtual classroom. Step on the side as we jump into section 5.4 in the Big Ideas Math Integrated Math 2 textbook on probability of disjoint and uh, overlapping events. So disjoint and overlapping. What's that going to look like? I just tried to show it with my hands. We're going to look at things in Venn diagram cases. They're going to have formulas for you. I think everything's going to start coming into fruition now. You understand probability as dividing something by a whole, and little bits are added at a time, but since it's such a smaller problem set, and you've seen things like dice rolls, coin flips, and card draws, I think we're going to start really just making sense of the types of problems more, now just using the new context with them to really put it in play in two more sections after this, of course. But before we get to those, let's look at this one. I'm going to start with the lecture and then the problem set. You can go in the description section down below and find timestamps for each corresponding part as we begin with the lecture. If you want to follow along with anything or print anything out, you can download the PDF down below of section 5.4. Without further ado, guys, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Oh, and grab a calculator, by the way. Uh, all the statistics stuff really needs calculators. We're going to learn how to find probabilities of compound events and use more than one probability rule to solve real life problems. I don't know what they mean about the second part. Um, we'll, we'll find out. So compound events is going to be a new phrase, overlapping events, and disjoint or mutually exclusive events. And actually, this is a good time to bring this up. I hardly ever use the phrase disjoint for myself, like off my own brain. I'll tend to use the phrase mutually exclusive. They are synonymous with each other, and I hope that they tend to use both. I hope they tend to use mutually exclusive more because I do. Um, even though that topic uh, is disjoint and overlapping events. So Venn diagrams are something of the past. You'd want to know what those are. Basically, with the overlapping circles idea, that's what a Venn diagram could be. So let's explore compound events as a whole. Uh, when you would consider all the outcomes for either of two events, A and B, you form the union of A and B as shown in the first diagram. So everything of A or everything of B or everything in between, which kind of counted them uh, doubly. When you consider only the outcomes shared by both A and B, you form the intersection of A and B, as shown in the second diagram. Now, I'm sure they're going to say this phrasing later, but union, you want to think of the word or. Intersection, you want to think of the word and, um, which is maybe something you've learned in the past. The union or intersection of two events is, call, is called a compound event. So you'll see what we mean by that, basically, when a result can come up in more than one sort of way and all that stuff. And yeah, we'll see that. <coughs> Excuse me. To find a probability of A or B, you must consider what outcomes, if any, are in the intersection of A and B. So even with an or case, the in-between is still important to talk about and is part of our formula and calculations on how it's going to be uh, used. Two uh, events are overlapping when they have one or more outcomes in common, as shown in the first two diagrams. Boom, boom. Two events are disjoint or mutually exclusive when they have no outcomes in common, as shown as the third diagram, as shown in the third diagram. So like, and they're going to talk about it, I'm sure, but flipping a coin and landing on heads or tails. You can never land on both at the same time. Whereas in this case here, when you draw a card, you can land on a heart and a face card at the same time. You know, you can have a face card that is a heart, something like that. So there's some overlap between all the hearts and all the face cards, something like that. Anyway, I'm sure they're going to have examples with those things, of course. Let's look at the probability of compound events, probability of A or B in two different forms. Um, let me talk about the bottom one first. If you have disjoint or mutually exclusive events, the probability of A or B is probability of A plus probability of B. Now, we haven't been adding probabilities too many times. We did in the most recent stuff when we're talking about like being in different cities. If you're in this city or this city or that city and you add up the probabilities. But in this case, or when we found totals, marginal things. But in this case, the or case is, you know, what's the probability of doing this or that? You add up this percentage with this percentage to make it happen. If they're mutually exclusive, that means that one, when one happens, the other possibly couldn't, the heads or tails case. So you simply just add those two probabilities up. Now, if A and B are any two events, are any two events, the probability of A or B can be used in this way. The thing is, though, when they're mutually exclusive, there is no probability of A or B occurring. That's why this is not in that formula. Now, why is this subtracted in this case? Because in a case of overlap, if I find everything that's A and everything that's B, notice there's an overlap of this part here where something is counted twice. So we have to take away one of them occurring, uh, one instance of that thing occurring. 
Um, what, like I said, we'll run through the examples. I want to show you exactly what I mean by that when we do that. If they don't explain it, I will be sure to do so. Okay, finding the probability of disjoint events. And they start with disjoint, mutually exclusive. A card is randomly selected from a deck of 52 playing cards. <gasps> Excuse me, what is the probability it is a 10 or a face card? So 10s and face cards are mutually exclusive because there's never a 10 that will ever be a face card. Here are all four of your 10s that are possible. Here are all 12 of your face cards that are possible. No 10s are face cards and vice versa. So in the Venn diagram scenario, there's no overlap. That's why the probability is just the sum of the two probabilities together. Probability of a 10 or a face card is 4 out of 52, 4 10s out of 52 cards, plus 12 face cards out of 52 cards, which is 16 out of 52, and they do the reduction. So they are disjoint, therefore you just do the addition. Now you could subtract the probability of being a 10 and a face card, but as you notice, that would be 0 out of 52, which means there's no change or effect on the answer. So there's the first example of something that's disjoint. Let's look at one that's overlapping, and it's perfect with a deck of cards, because we were just talking about that before. A card is randomly selected from a standard deck of 52 playing cards. What is the probability it is a face card or a spade? So when they draw these out, and again, unless they make me draw them out, I probably won't be doing that, although I might say them out loud. Event A is all the different face cards you can have. The kings, queens, and jacks of diamonds, clubs, hearts, and spades. Now all the spades are right here, which includes the king, queen, and jack. If you notice, there's an overlap of king, queen, and jack, and if you count everything event A, that's 12 different face cards, including king of spades, queen of spades, jack of spades. If you include everything in event B that's all the spades, that's 13 out of 52 spades, including the king of spades, queen of spades, and jack of spades. As you notice, it was included twice. If I add 12 and 13, that is 25 cards, but three of them were doubled up. The king, queen, and jack was counted twice. So we have to take away the overlapping king, the probability of being both a spade and a face card. There, That's three out of the 52. So you have to recognize which ones are counted there in a case that's um, not mutually exclusive, in a case that's overlapping. So you subtract that, you get 22 out of 52. Eventually you get uh, your 42.3%. See, if there's overlap, you can end up getting more than 100%. And I'm not saying that's what makes it wrong. I'm saying that's a good way of letting yourself know that something is wrong with that. Um, outside of the fact that it just shouldn't be that way. Okay, using a formula to find a probability of A and B. Let's see what they want to talk about here. Out of 200 students in a senior class, 113 students are either varsity athletes or are or on the honor roll. There are 74 seniors who are varsity athletes and 51 seniors who are on the honor roll. What's the probability a randomly selected senior is both a varsity athlete and on honor roll? So if you notice straight up off the bat, 74 senior uh, athletes plus 51 seniors equals 200, uh, 125 total students. 125 is more than 113. You say, wait a minute. They said there are 113 seniors that are athletes or on honor roll. 74 are seniors, 51 are, are athletes. Uh, sorry. Excuse me, I was saying this wrong. 74 seniors are athletes, 51 seniors are on honor roll. There we go. Um, why, why the discrepancy? Because some of the senior, uh, some of the athletes are also on honor roll. There's an overlap. And so that's what we have there. Right, if I said there are 40 people, uh, sorry, there are 20 people in um, chess club, 30 are, oh gosh, I get, I didn't say this right. There are 20 people that are in chess club, 20 of them are math leets, and 20 of them are science leets. Wait, what, 20 plus 20 is 40. What if all of them were math leets and science leets? I don't know, I don't think science leets is a term. I'm bad at coming up with my own examples on the spot. Let's keep going. Let's let them read the rest, say the rest. Let event A be selecting a senior who's a varsity athlete, and event B be a senior who's on the honor roll. From the given information, we know that probability of A is 74 out of 200, probability of B is 51 out of 200, and probability of A or B is 113 out of 200. So the idea here is that when you say A or B is going to be A plus B, you have to also take away the A and B, understanding that these are not mutually exclusive events. Just because you're on honor roll doesn't mean you can't be an athlete. So there can be two sets of them. So we just got to solve. It's basically an algebra thing from here. Honestly, I would just add these up and subtract you know, 113 there and add that. Basically, you get that probability of A and B is 12. There are 12 seniors who are both athletes and on honor roll in this set when you end up solving this thing straight up. So I'm sure we're going to have to do the same in our own examples. 
All right, using more than one probability of rule. I still don't know what they mean by that, so let's go ahead and take a look at what they're talking about. In the first four sections of this chapter, you've learned several probability rules. The solution to some real life problems may require the use of two or more of these rules as shown in the next example. The ADA estimates that 8.3% of people in the United States have diabetes. Suppose that a medical lab has developed a simple diagnostic test for diabetes that is 98% accurate for people who have the disease and 95% accurate for people who don't have it. The medical lab gives a test to a randomly selected person. What's the probability the diagnosis is correct? Okay, so, uh, well, here, I'll let them talk about it, but now I see what they're saying. They're saying use some of the previous information that we learned about how things operated before and work off that like in terms of independence, in terms of uh, something that is not that a complement, you know, probability of A, probability of not A, things like that, as, as well as things with mutual exclusion and what we're talking about. Um, okay, let A, let event A be a person that has diabetes. So first of all, we have to say what's the probability of a person having diabetes. They said 8.3%, just as far as a randomly selected person. Um, and event B be the correct diagnosis. So first we're going to have event A occur and then event B occur. If the, whether the person has diabetes or not, whether the, uh, what do they say? They get the correct diagnosis or not. And the probability changes based on whether or not you have diabetes. So we get to kind of see all the different forms of this uh, happen. In fact, this kind of reminds me of the section 5.2 problem I was doing with the football strategy things. If you kick a field goal or not, if you make the two point conversion or not, um, it kind of reminds me of that. So we kind of teased that earlier. Um, notice the probability of B depends on the occurrence of A so that events are dependent. Yes, when A occurs, when a person has diabetes, the correct diagnosis is made 98% of the time versus if they don't have diabetes, the correct uh, diagnosis is formed 95% of the time. So there's a difference there. So depending on whether you have diabetes or not, you have a different probability of a correct diagnosis. So these events are dependent. A probability tree diagram where the probabilities are given along the branches can help you see the different ways to obtain a correct diagnosis. And you can bet I'm going to do this. It helps me as well as helps me teach it. Uh, use the complements of events A and B to complete the diagram. Yes, either you can have diabetes or not in the scenario of, in terms of probability. You can either get a correct diagnosis or not. And that's that's the thing. You don't have diabetes as A bar. You don't have uh, correct, incorrect diagnosis as B bar. So what they do is they start to branch these things out. They write the decimal equivalents of these percentages of the probabilities, starting from the population, the 8.3% of people do, 91.7% people don't, and then so on and so forth. And you start to see some information. Now, what you end up doing in these things is, and they did say follow the branches. In terms of following the branches, you end up doing a multiplication, if you will. You can multiply this by this to get the probability that somebody has diabetes and gets a correct diagnosis or this times this for the probability someone has diabetes and gets an incorrect diagnosis, and so on and so forth down the line. Doesn't have diabetes with a correct diagnosis, doesn't have diabetes with an incorrect diagnosis. And then you kind of end up getting some information from that. To, f to find the probability that the diagnosis is correct, you follow the branches leading up to event B. So yes, uh, probability diagnosis is correct. There are two different forms. You could have a correct diagnosis from diabetes, and you could have a correct diagnosis without having diabetes. And you want to add those two, probability of this or that, which are mutually exclusive in that way. So you get to multiply those things, as I stated before, this times this plus that times that, and apparently it becomes 95.2%. Whether or not you have diabetes, see, you walk in there maybe not knowing you have diabetes. Like, what's the probability of a correct diagnosis? Well, it's 95.2% as, as an aggregate, as a whole, as an average. So that's what they mean by the more than one rule thing. And I'm game for that. And that's the, that, that's it. I'm like, that's the it. That is it for the lecture portion. Let's go ahead and look into the vocabulary and core concept check for the stuff. Are the events A and A bar disjoint explained and give an example of a real life event and its complement? Yes, because, because um, probability of A is some value. Probability, excuse me, I'll just say probability of A is a uh, bar is one minus the probability of A. The idea behind this is anything that's not A is A bar in a, prob in a binomial condition of either this will happen or this won't happen. Either you can, which I can, I can come up with this, but are they disjoint? Yes, disjoint means mutually exclusive. If one happens, then the other doesn't happen. Um, like the heads or tails case. Let me give a more distinct one. 
with uh, how about a dice roll? Either you roll a three, uh, either you roll less than three, or you roll greater than or equal to three. Right? You can't roll both less than three and greater than or equal to three. It's it's just that scenario. But really, either you flip heads or tails, right? That kind of thing. Which is less than three or less than three not. All right, number two. Different words, same question. Which is different? Find both answers. So A, how many outcomes are in the intersection of A and B? So there are two outcomes in the intersection of A and B. Make sure that we remember that. How many outcomes are shared by both A and B? That sounds like an A, and that answer would also be two. How many outcomes are in the union of A and B? Okay, that's a different question. So the union is the or case. By the way, this answer is two. In the union of A and B is everything. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And remember, there's overlap right there. How many, uh, so that's different. And then this must be A. How many outcomes in B are also in A? Yeah, that one's also two. So whatever's in B that's also in A is just those guys right there. So that's the different one. We found both. Okay, let's go to the problem set. I believe it's a shorter set as an overall. I hope that it does go a little more quickly. Let's check it out. Numbers 3 through 23. But of course, you know what that means. They're probably going to be longer problems. But either way, I hope I'm helpful for you regardless of what we do. So let's go ahead and get started. In numbers three through six, events A and B are disjoint, find probability of A or B. So a disjoint set means that they are mutually exclusive. That means that there's no overlap between the two. So for number three, with the probability of A being 0.3, 30%, probability of B being 0.1, that's 10%, probability of A or B occurring is simply 0.3 plus 0.1, which is 0.4, which is 40%. So not much I have to say on that, especially if you heard the lecture portion, but the idea behind mutual exclusive uh, exclusion is there is no overlap between these sets right there. Let me kind of change my pen that I was using. Probability of A in this next one is going to be 0.55 or 55%. Probability of B is 0.2 or 20%. And probability of A or B is just adding those very interesting that all they're doing is just going to have us uh, do quick addition on these. I know I'm copying down the problems, slowing it down a little bit. But yeah, it's simply the addition of those as long as they're disjoint. Number five, probability. Oh, here we go. We have to deal with the fraction. Probability of A is one third and probability of B is one fourth. So now they're testing your ability to work off of because I'm not going to write the decimal version. I'm still going to use the fraction but probability of A or B. In this case, we have to do one third plus one fourth. I'm going to leave some space on the outside of this to work off a common denominator. I have to multiply top and bottom of this one by 4. I wrote 3. By 4 over 4, and this one by 3 over 3. So 4 fourths times 1 third is 4 twelfths, and 1 fourth times uh, 3 thirds is it's 3 twelfths. I can't speak. And that becomes 7 twelfths. 7 twelfths. Probability of A or B occurring. More than 50%. One third plus one fourth is more than 50% likely. And then number six, we have two thirds plus one fifth that's going to be happening here. Happening here. See if you can come up with the common denominator while I'm writing this thing out. Probability of A is two thirds. Probability of B occurring is one fifth. And they are once again mutually exclusive. So probability of A or B is two thirds plus one fifth. Okay. Um, as far as common denominator, 15 shall be that common denominator, which means I'm going to multiply top and bottom of this one by 5. That's 10 fifteenths. And top and bottom of this one by 3 is 3 fifteenths. We get 13 fifteenths from those guys. Very close to 100% of everything. Okay, let's keep moving forward to number 7. Your dart is equally likely to hit any point inside the dartboard shown. That includes the board not hitting one of these balloons. You throw a dart and pop a balloon... What is the probability that the balloon is red or blue? Oh, so, okay. So given that you pop a balloon, I guess we're saying that you're not going to hit the dart because we're not calculating area. All these balloons look like they're the same size and everything's likely on there. And they're saying you do pop a balloon. So I'm going to start with this. Probability of 
red, given that you pop a balloon, and I don't know if it's worth mentioning the whole given that, but there are one, two, three, four, five, six reds out of, looks like five, 10, 15, 20 total balloons. I'm gonna leave it at six out of 20 for now. I, I know I can reduce it. Generally, guys, you probably don't wanna reduce things until the end because sometimes things reduce differently. Sometimes things don't reduce at all. And you just saw what we had to do to get a common denominator. So if you leave it raw to begin with, if they're out of the same things, I would add those first and reduce later. So probability of blue, given that you pop a balloon or that you hit a balloon, there are one, two, three blue balloons out of 20. Um, I once again want to apologize for any of the colorblind crowd, and I seriously mean that. If there's a color you can't distinguish between, I got the blue ones here, and I know it doesn't, you're like, oh, you're still using blue anyway. I'm circling which ones they are. I'm not going to do this generally. I'm just letting you know. And the reds, I want to make sure I counted them right as well. There's six reds. I don't think you're confusing red with blue. You might confuse red with green, though, or green with uh, purple. I know some people have that. All right. Anyway, moving forward. Probability of red or blue. The thing about this, remember, given that you popped a balloon, the thing about this is they are mutually exclusive. If you pop a red, you didn't pop a blue and vice versa. So we're going to add 6 out of 20 with 3 out of 20. And we get 9 out of 20. Now, I know, I know I didn't write percentages before. I'm more inclined to do so now that we're kind of getting into word problem territory. And this is exactly, what, 45%? 45% chance that you will pop a red or a blue balloon. So about almost half of them. Um, notice how 6 out of 20 would have reduced to 3 tenths. And 3 tenths plus 3 twentieths suddenly is, oh no, now I have to get a common denominator. You can see where that would have been an issue. 3 twentieths can't reduce. So it's a good thing I didn't do that. Number eight. You and your friend are among several candidates running for class president. You estimate there's a 45% chance you will win and 25% chance your friend will win. What's the probability you or your friend will win the election? Once again, if you, if you win then your friend doesn't, and vice versa. So probability of you win is 0.45. Probability of friend win is so much lower, 0.25. Probability of you or friend win. Mutually exclusive means we just add those probabilities up. So 0.45 plus 0.25, and that's 0.70 or 70%. 70% odds that you or your friend win. 30% chance that neither you nor your friend win. As long as one of us win, we're happy. And there's a great, there's a massive likelihood that one of us wins. Number nine. You are performing an experiment to determine how well plants grow under different light sources. Of the 30 plants in the experiment, 12 receive visible light. 15 receive ultraviolet light, and 6 receive both visible and ultraviolet light. What's the probability a plant in the experiment receives visible or ultraviolet light? Okay, this is one that's not mutually exclusive. If you noticed, 12 plus 15 is 27, plus 6 is 33. That's more than there are, right? That's more than there are. So the 6 represents overlap among the 27 from the 12 and 15 that are here. Among those 27, six of them are receiving both. This is, in a way, a Venn diagram where there is, um, and what I'm going to write are numbers that represent just the individual portions when we get there, I suppose. Um, visible light versus UV light. There's a six that's an overlap among the 12 represented here and the 15 represented here. Remember, there's overlap there. So just be very, very careful to that. Okay, what's the probability a plant in the experiment receives visible or ultraviolet light? So probability of visible or ultraviolet. You have 12 out of the 30 who receive visible, 15 out of the 30 that receive ultraviolet. Now, among those, this six was counted twice. There is overlap there 
of those that receive both. So we take away six of those 30 from that set and you're left with just a grand total of 27 minus six, which is 21 out of 30 of them. 21 out of 30 also reduces to seven out of 10, which is 70%. 70% of all the lights receive either one or the other. Now, what you'd wanna do in this case is, I wouldn't really truly wanna have a 12 here because what I wanna do is just the ones that, you, that simply only get visible light and that's six. I take six away from 12 and I should also take six away from 15 and get nine. As you can tell, this is the six that are strictly visible light, nine that are strictly ultraviolet light, and six of them receive both the visible and the ultraviolet. Six plus six plus nine is 21. So 21 out of the 30 or 70% receive both. All right, let's go to number 10. On number 10, of 162 students honored at an academic awards banquet, 48 are uh, for mathematics. Hold on, number 10. 48 won for mathematics, so probability of math, I think in like a randomly selected case, probability of math is 48 out of 162. English won 78. Do, 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 do. There are 14 students who won awards for both English and math, or math and English. So probability of M and E is 14. A newspaper chooses a student at random for an interview. What's the probability that the student interviewed won an award for English or mathematics? So probability, this was M and E. We need English or math, M or E. Not mutually exclusive. Some that won math also won English because of the overlap that's involved. Because 48 plus 78 is more than 162. So we're going to take the 48 out of 162 plus the 78 out of 162 and subtract the overlap that is the 14 out of 162 that have been counted twice in this set somewhere here. 48 plus 78 is 126. And 126 minus 14 is 112. So you get 112 out of 162, which is 56 out of 81. Oh, that can reduce more, can't it? Oh, wait, no, it can't. Wait, so, uh, 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 no. <laughs> 56 out of 81, let's see. Maybe it can, but I don't know what it is or so. 0.691. So 69.1%. I like them odds that you're gonna randomly choose somebody who will. We'll take it. Number 11 and 12, error analysis. Describe and correct the error in finding the probability of randomly drawing the given card from a standard deck of cards. So we saw some lecture portion questions regarding cards, but this is our first one doing together. Probability of a heart or face card, they add probability of heart with probability of face card and they get the 25 out of 52. The problem is there is overlap in this set. Now we'd have to know logically something about cards, right? I've, I mentioned that in previous sections. They neglected the overlap of doubling the count for heart cards that uh, face heart face cards. The jack, queen, and king of hearts. They were counted twice. They must subtract them out. They must subtract the overlap from their sum, from their sum. Okay, so they have the first part right. They, there are 13 hearts in a deck. Probability of heart or face card is correctly 13 out of 52, plus there are 12 Face cards out of 52, three per suit, four suits total. In the heart suit, there are three that are face cards. They've been counted twice. They've been counted in this set. They've been counted in this set. We only need to count them once. So we got to take one of the sets away for overlap. And we're going to get 22 out of 52. 22 out of 52, which is 11 out of 26. And 11 out of 26 is... They didn't write a decimal thing, but... 
or percentage, 42.3%. Just about. Pretty good odds. Number 12, probability of club or nine. Um, I think you can see it. They have the ideas of the numbers right, but they added the one out of 52. They are increasing their overlap by even more. They added one. They should have been subtracting one. So they're, because the events are not mutually exclusive... Since there is a nine of clubs, there's one nine of clubs, they were correct in including it in their formula or calculation, but they added it instead of subtracting. And I'll be honest, whenever I see these error analysis questions, I really like them because they tend to be things that students tend to do. And we get to talk about it and kind of dispel what it is. I don't often see students make this mistake. If they if they make the mistake, it's because they didn't include it. But adding it instead? No. They I think they often understand the idea of subtracting it here. So 13 plus 14 or plus 4 is 17. Minus 1 is 16. So 16 out of 52, which reduces to 8 out of 26. Oh, that can be even more than that. Uh, 4 out of 13. 4 out of 13 which is about 0 0.3076, 30.8%, 30.8%. Yeah, I don't often see the addition of that one on top of it doing the like, or, or the, uh, or the nine of clubs, right? Nine of clubs was already counted kind of twice there, so we're not doing that again. All right, next exercise is 13 and 14. You roll a six-sided die. Find the probability of A or B. So we'll have to see if they're mutually exclusive or not. Sometimes we have to work out what those sets actually look like when we write them. So event A, you roll a 6. Event B, you roll a prime number. So yeah, let's talk about those. Inside the set of A is just the number 6. Inside the set of prime numbers, you might not know them, but 2 is a prime number, 3 is a prime number, 5 is a prime number. No even number other than 2 is prime. 1 is not a prime number. And um, the first prime, the first composite number, odd number is nine. So these are the ones here. So this has a one out of six probability. This has a three out of six probability. There is no overlap between the two, so they are mutually exclusive. So probability of A or B is one out of six plus three out of six. I mean, literally. So 4 out of 6, or 2 thirds, or 66.7%. Literally, what you could do in this kind of set right here is literally just kind of show what they are as a whole. Their whole set of any of 6 or any primes is 2, 3, 5, 6. You can see where that 4 comes from there. That's where the 4 comes from when you see it. There's no overlap. Nothing was counted more than once. Number 14, you roll an odd number or you roll a number less than five. Once again, it's best that you possibly just come up with what those sets are going to look like. What are our odd numbers on a six-sided die? One, three, and five. That's three of them out of six in terms of probability. Event B, you roll a number less than five. Five doesn't count among them, but that's one, two, three, and four, and that's four out of six. Now, if you notice, three plus four is seven. But if you also notice, there is overlap among the one and the three in both of these. There is a set of two things that we shouldn't put together in total. When you see this entire set, you only count one once, you only count three once, and ultimately you see that the probability is going to be five out of six. Now, how's that going to work for us for probability of A or B? We're actually going to calculate it by doing three out of six plus four out of six, and then minus the overlap of these two, A and B is one and three. So the two out of six, the one and the three that it was counted twice. We don't count it twice. Three plus four is seven, minus two is five. We get five out of six there, which is about 83.3%. Five out of six or 83.3%. That's where the overlap comes from. That's where there's no mutual exclusion in that scenario of events A or B. Number 15, drawing conclusions. 
A group of 40 trees in a forest are not growing properly. A botanist determines that 34 of the trees have a disease or are being damaged by insects, with 18 trees having a disease and 20 being damaged by insects. What's the probability a randomly select, selected tree has both a disease and is being damaged by insects? So these two events are not mutually exclusive. You can be, you can have a disease and be damaged by insects or not. And we're just working off that formula, the idea of the A or B is A plus B minus the A and B part. And we got to find the A and B part. So probability of A or B, the tree damage, excuse me, the, the tree disease or the insect damage is 34 out of 40. 34 out of 40. And I'm not going to reduce the fraction for now just in case I, you know, there are 40 trees. Probability of A, let's call that disease, is 18 out of 40. And probability of B, insect damage, is 20 out of 40. Again, don't reduce just yet because we're going to calculate things out of 40. So probability of A or B occurring is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. Basically, there's overlap there's overlap. So I can add probability of A and B to both sides, make that positive, subtract pro um, probability of A or B from both sides, the 34, and combine the 18 with the 20. 18 plus 20 is 38. So 38 of the 40 trees, not really, but 38 of 40 trees seemingly have one or the other, but of course there's some overlap. We're going to figure out what that is when we take away the fact that truly only 34 of the 40 have them. So it looks like it's going to become 4 out of 40. So four out of 40 or one tenth, which is 10%. One tenth or 10% of all the trees are four of them. How about that? Oh, what is the, did it say probability? Yeah, 10%. Four of the 40 trees have both insect damage and a disease, 10% of them. Number 16, a company paid overtime wages or hired temporary help during nine months of the year. Overtime wages were paid during seven months and temporary help was hired during four months. You saw that it was during nine months, so there's overlap here. At the end of the year, an auditor examines the accounting records and randomly selects one month to check the payroll. What's the probability the auditor will select a month in which the company paid overtime wages and hired temporary help? So see, it wasn't 11 of the months when you add the seven to four. It was just the nine, which means there's some overlap. And hopefully you kind of see that overlap. So if A... If A was overtime, wait, let's do the A or B first. If A or B was both overtime or temporary, that's nine out of 12 months in the year. Probability of just A on overtime was seven out of the 12, seven months out of the 12. And probability of B for temporary help was four out of the 12. So same thing as last time, nine twelfths. That's 7 twelfths plus 4 twelfths minus, minus probability of A and B. So let's do the same things last time. I'm going to add the 7 and 4. I'm going to subtract the 9 from there. And that'll equal probability of A and B as I do the algebra to get that to its side. And that gets us to 2 out of 12, which is 1 sixth, which is 16.7%. On the one six trade. Yeah, two out of the twelve months at wait, hold on a second. Oh, yeah, it was the and. Two of the two out of the twelve months in the year, we had both temporary help and overtime wages paid. Number 17. A company is focused testing a new type of fruit drink. Oh, excuse me. A company is focused testing. I thought they said focused on. A company is focus testing a new type of fruit drink. The focus group is 47% male. Of the responses, 40% of the males and 54% of the females said they would buy the fruit drink. What is the probability a randomly selected person would buy the fruit drink? So this is a different kind of question. What you have is male, female, and would buy, would not buy. So there's kind of two events going on. Event A is a gender thing, male or not male, which in, in this case they're saying female. 
So I'll just say gender, gender category. And event B is whether they would buy it, buy drink. So I'll do the kind of like male, well, I'll just do male versus not male kind of thing. Let's see, focus test. So in this focus test, here's what could happen. You could either be, in terms of random selection, you could either be male or female. And as a male, you can either say you would buy or not buy. Same thing as a female, but this is dependent on what gender you are when it comes to probabilities. Buy or not buy. Let's break down these probabilities. In this focus group, 47% were male. That's 0.47. That means everybody else was female, 0.53. Or not male, but they say female later. 40% of the males said they'd buy the drink. If 40% said they'd buy it, that means 60% say they wouldn't or didn't say they'd buy it. For males, females were different. 54% said they'd buy it, so there's a different set for females. And that means 1 minus 54, 100 minus 54 is 46. 46% wouldn't say they'd buy it. They asked, what's the probability a randomly selected person would buy the fruit drink? So what we're going to do in all these cases here is we want to multiply this set. Probability of male and would buy is 0.47 times 0.4, zero. And then male and no buy is 0.47 times 0 0.60. We're basically taking the 40% and splitting 47% and splitting up into 40 and 60 in that own pie. And we're taking the 53% split, splitting up in 54 and 46. There's no part of the percentage that's left out of the 100% when we consider everything here. So this is 0.53 times 0.54. And this is 0.53 times 0.46. Now, I, do I need to calculate all of these? No. The only ones I need to calculate are the ones that say they buy it. What's the probability a randomly selected person would buy the drink? We have to look at all the males who would buy it and all the females who would buy it, and we would add them up because they're mutually exclusive. There's no overlap. These are the only two that matter when it comes to my calculations. So I am going to be doing 0 0.47, 0 0.47 times 0.4, and here I'm getting 0.188 of the focus test group. 18.8% .8 of the focus test group were males that said they would buy. When I do 0.53 times 0.54 and get the number 0.2862, what that says is 28.62% of all the focus test individuals were females who said they'd buy the drink. So how many, what's the probability a random selected person said they'd buy the drink? Probability of buy is all them males plus all them females. 0.188 plus 0.2862, which is, and I'll get the exact when it comes to that, because these are not rounded, 0.4742, which is 47.42%. Now, I didn't calculate these two. I could have, but eventually, when you essentially, when you add this up with this, this up, that means that 52.58% of those people would not buy the drink. But you see the uh, dependency on whether you're male or female and how that thing pans out. Number 18, the Redbirds trail the Bluebirds by one goal with one minute left in the hockey game. The Redbirds coach must decide whether to remove the goalie and add a frontline player. The probabilities of each team scoring are shown in the table. Hold on. Redbirds coach must decide whether to remove the goalie and add a frontline player. So the Redbirds, if the Redbirds remove a goalie, their percentage goes from 10% of scoring to 30%. If the Bluebirds, excuse me, if the Redbirds remove a goalie, the Bluebirds' chance of scoring a goal goes from 10% to 60% because there's no goalie. Why do the Redbirds' uh, probability increase? Because they have a sixth player on the rink that's not 
the goalie. You know what I mean? Uh, so, let's see. Find the probability the Redbirds score and the Bluebirds do not score when the coach leaves the goalie in. So, when the coach leaves the goalie in, probability of Redbirds score... Let's see how I want to do this. Um, Because I don't want to write a whole sentence here. Uh, I'll put RG. RG is for Redbird score with goalie. We also need... So hold on. That, that itself is 0.1. Probability that... The Redbirds score, and the Bluebirds do not score when the coach leaves the Redbirds goalie in. Probability of Blue not scoring with goalie in. Gosh, this is going to be hard to say. That's going to be 90%. There's a 90% chance that they don't score. That's 1 minus 0.1. So probability of these both occurring, you got to multiply that. Probability of Redbird score... And bluebird, blue bluebird, bluebird not score with that goalie in is 0. 0.1 times 0. 0.9, which should be 0. 0.09, which is 9%. There's a 9% chance of that occurring. So not very good with the minute left. So not very good for the Redbirds' chances of winning in that scenario. All right, part B. Sorry, I really had to speak that thing through. Find the probability the Redbirds score and the Bluebirds do not score when the coach takes the goalie out. So now, probability of Redbirds scoring no goalie is 0.3, 30%. Probability of Bluebirds not scoring with no goalie, that's no goalie for the Redbirds, by the way, not for the Bluebirds. Bluebirds had a 60% chance of scoring. They have a 40% chance of not scoring, therefore. So let's combine those ones, probability of Redbirds score without a goalie and Bluebirds don't score without that goalie is 0.3 times 0.4, which is 0.12 or 12%. Not much higher because the thing is, even though the Redbirds got a triple opportunity there, Bluebirds had a good chance of scoring and they didn't. So, you know, there's that. It's higher, but not much. Based on parts A and B, what should the coach do? Well, there's a higher percentage that they would score in this thing. So pull your goalie. The Redbirds coach should pull their goalie because they have a better chance. Remember, this is about remember, they need this to happen. They need to they're down by a goal. They need to score a goal without the Bluebird scoring. Because they have a better chance of tying the game by doing so it's not much better but it's better you you play odds i mean it's not you know it's not a casino you know things happen just because how they do in sports but you know sometimes you got to go with your gut instinct but if this is like a if this is a roll of the dice in that way you go with that dice roll that's going to help you best okay number 19 you can win concert tickets from a radio station if you're the first person to call when the song of the day is played or 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 if you're the per first person to correctly answer the trivia question. The song of the day is announced at a random time between 7 a.m. and 7.30 a.m. The trivia question is asked at a random time between 17 a.m. and 7.15 7 a.m. and 7.45 a.m. You begin listening to the radio station at 7.20. Oh. Find the probability that you miss the announcement of the song of the day or the trivia question. Okay. So first of all, notice there's overlap in time. Between 7 and 7.30 is here. Between 7.15 and 7.45 is here. Now, I guess we can go by minute intervals. Um, if you start listening to the radio station at 7.20, I mean, you don't have to do minute intervals, but they're showing minute-based things. The probability of hearing the song of the day, song of day probability of you hearing that are the remaining because it's 7 to 7 30 so from 7 20 to 7 30 is 10 minutes 
10 minutes out of the 30 minutes is the chance that you have of hearing that one. Let's leave it like that for now. See if we have to add things in a bit. Probability of hearing the announcement of the trivia question. Probability of trivia question. You start at 720. That's from 715 to 745. That's 25 out of the 30 minutes. 25 out of the 30 minutes there. Now, if you understand there's overlap in time for the, for the time that there's the song of the day that can be played and the trivia question that can be heard, and that's that span from 720 to 730 because during that time, both the song and the trivia question can occur at any time there because song goes from 7 to 730, trivia goes from 715 to 745. Between the time you start listening at 720 till 730 when the song portion ends, 10 minutes, 10 minutes within there is is a window that you can't, you know, whatever. Probability of uh, overlap, song and trivia. Now here's the interesting part that I'm thinking about. What is this out of? That's 10 minutes. But that's out of a 45 minute stretch. So the question is, what were these supposed to also be out of? These probably were supposed to be out of 45 because this is within that 45 minute window. Just because, just because those played at 30 minute increments doesn't mean it's not within that window that we care about or that we're listening to. It's a 45 minute window in which you could hear those things. Um, but you start listening at 720. Let's do that again. Let's do that again. You start listening at 725 and the probability you miss the announcement of the song of the day or trivia question. I'm trying to think about whether the 45 counts for everything from 7 o'clock or from when I start listening. It's probability you missed it. So I'll say this matters. 45 minutes matters for song of the day. Absolutely. Trivia question. It does matter. There were five minutes that you would have missed, although I count it right there. Oh. Let's call this all for this Boy, I'm having trouble thinking about what I want to do here. Let me let me think about this one. Let me think about this one. Okay, I started thinking some stuff. I'm going to wipe these out a little bit. What I spoke about was okay to start with, and then I started changing up my thought. Let's do this again. First of all, they're asking probability you'll miss the announcement, not that you'll make it. Second of all, the more I think about it, these events are independent. But these events being independent, one one time announcement doesn't depend on the other time's announcement. If the song of the day is announced, whatever, that doesn't affect when the um, trivia question is announced. So let's take that in consideration. All right. Probability of song of the day of missing this. Here's the important part. Hold on. I have to sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me. Probability of missing song of the day. Missing the trivia question. Missing song and trivia. I have a 30 minute stretch to hear the song of the day. I miss 20 of those 30 minutes. That's 20 out of 30 percent, or that's 20 out of 30 probability that I miss the song of the day. Trivia question. It started at 7.15 till 7.45. That's a 30 minute stretch. I missed five of those minutes if I start at 7.20. If I missed five of the minutes, that's five out of 30. Probability missing both. That's where the independent part comes in. That's where you multiply these two things together. Probability of A and B because they're independent. So 20 out of 30 times 5 out of 30. To miss both, you got to miss one and miss the other. That's the multiplication aspect. That's 100 out of 900, which is 1 ninth. Right? Um, 
I say one ninth there, given that, that it's not going to get me a common. Oh, you know, what? I could do a common denominator. Let's let's do that. Let me uh, let's write that as uh, divide by thirty. Oh, no, I couldn't. All right, let's just do one ninth. Let's do one ninth. I'll get a common denominator with them eventually. All right, so probability of miss both or miss miss one or the other. See, if I miss one or the other, I could still get one I'm not sure suddenly how that how that comes to me but we add this with that and we subtract that um maybe I should reduce these fractions and go for common no you know what no 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 because I can add those two to start with so I get 25 out of 30 minus one ninth which is five out of six minus one ninth okay now we'll go for common denominator can multiply this by 3 over 3, we get 15 over 18. Multiply this by 2 over 2, you get 2 over 18. And as a total, that becomes 13 over 18, which is um, 72.2%. So, yeah, probability that you miss one or the other. It sounds like you can still get one. From that, like, ah, I missed I missed one or the other, but it's okay, at least if I, as long as I got one of them. I'm trying to think if that sounds right or not. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, one or the other or both, but you could have gotten one. I don't know. All right, number 20. <laughs> How do you see it? Are events A and B disjoint events? Explain your reasoning. No, they are not disjoint events. There's overlap and there's information in the overlap. No, they are not disjoint or mutually exclusive events. There is an overlap with A and B containing an occurrence of an event, uh, of either event. There's that, that one dot right here in the middle. All right. Number 21, problem solving. You take a bus from your neighborhood to your school. The express bus arrives at your neighborhood. Ooh, the times thing. I just had trouble with it. The express bus arrives at your neighborhood at random time at a random time between 7:30 and 7:36 a.m. The local bus arrives at your neighborhood at a random time between 7:30 and 7:40 a.m. You arrive at the bus stop at 7:33 a.m. Find the probability you missed both the bus, express bus, and the local bus. So missing one and the other. Um, I think that's just now the multiplication of the things because once again, they are independent. Missing one doesn't affect your probability of missing the other. But the probabilities just are what they are. So for 21, I think it's just the and thing. So probability of miss express. It's a time between 7.30 and 7.36. You arrive at 7.33. You missed three of the six minutes. You missed three of the six minutes. Now that's one half. I think we're just going to multiply these. So I'm going to just do that one. Probability of miss the local. You arrived at 7.33 and it goes from 7.30 to 7.40. You missed three minutes of the 10 that are there. So probability of miss express and local, I believe should just be the three six or one half times three tenths, which is three twentieths, which is 15%. You have a 15% chance of missing both, or you could end up, you know, getting one or the other during the rest of that time. Hopefully, even if one was missed, the other can still be had and remember they're independent. They're independent. So that problem seemed easier than the one before, not just because we did one before. It's just there's only one part that's considered just the and part, whereas the and part was used in the other problem alongside other parts to finish the or. Number 22, thought-provoking. Write a general rule for finding probability of A or B or C for disjoint and overlapping events A, B, and C. The disjoint one, now that's just, there's there's no, you know, that, that one's straightforward. Probability of A or B or C means you can just add all three together. Probability of A, 
plus probability of B plus probability of C. There's no overlap for these things. So any of them can occur just like that, just fine. Second one's a little interesting. And for me, I even have to kind of, I have to work it out in like a Venn diagram sense because it's the best way I can picture it. It's the best way I think I can explain it to you guys. So I'm going to do that and hopefully I can progress through this properly as I go. So what I want to do is this. I'm going to come up with three circles and they're going to overlap, right? A, B, and C. But the thing is, they don't just overlap with each other in these, part, you know, one with the other. They really overlap with each other. So it's like this, right? There's full, full on overlap among all three sets. It's like the, uh, I forget what logo that's like. But here's A, here's B, here's C. Okay. So the way that this would work, I believe, I, I've, I've done this, but it's just been so long. Probability of A or B or C. See, when it's just pff, A or B or B, when it's just overlap of two, you could understand why we have to remove one of the things from it because it was counted twice. So we, we do begin with A plus B plus C. But if you notice, and I'm going to do this in a different way. I'm going to kind of do like a shading ordeal here. So for like A, I'll shade it here in this blue. It's going to kind of get wonky anyway. Yeah, what does that happen? Hold on. Let me, let me use my other pen. Let's see if this improves it. For A, I'm going to use this blue. That's better. For B, I'm going to use this green. If you notice, there's overlap of the blue and green. So that's something we have to take out. And C, I'm going to use kind of a red. Okay. So, here's the thing. We just got overlap here. Whoops. We got overlap here. And we got to take that out. We got to do minus... We got to take out probability of A and B. There's also overlap right here of B and C. We got to take that out. And then we also have to take out the overlap of A and C. I'm sorry, that was A and C that I just showed. B and C is right here, the green and the red. And then A and C is right here. So we got to take out all those. However, the middle part just got removed several times. And this is the part that I got to think hard about. See, we have now properly taken care of everything surrounding this in this fashion. We've taken care of everything surrounding it that would ideally be in blue right here. There's no overlap now among all this. There was overlap three times overlap right here, but then we removed three different aspects of double overlap portions, which makes me have to think about how many have been added and how many have been removed that we have to now place back in, right? That's the part that kind of ends up being a little buggy on this thing here. So where there's something else we have to add back in after it's been taken out, and that's the A and B and C overlap. But how many times was it removed for you know for that part? And that's the part I have to think about here. So I maybe just there's only one more that has to be added in because we removed all three, and I think that's what happened was we added this in three times, right? This is a combination of blue, green, and red that was inside here. But then since we removed this and we removed this, and we removed this, then we removed three sets of them. So we have to, I believe, reinsert it back, a probability of A and B and C. I want to make sure that it's not like a multiple kind of like, we do it multiple times, if that makes sense. So I don't know, that's just my thought. And I believe that's it, where we just have that there. So I think it's that. I don't know. I, I don't write this formula often, but that's what I think it is. I was confusing myself as to whether it's like two times it or three times it, but I think that's it. Okay. And then, yeah, that's us, that's us adding in A and B and C after it's all kind of removed there.
Okay, and the last question, number 23, making an argument. A bag contains 40 cards numbered 1 through 40 that are either red or blue. A card is drawn at random and placed back in the bag. This is done four times. Two red cards are drawn, numbered 31 and 19. Two blue cards are drawn, number 22 and 7. Your friend concludes that red cards and even numbers must be mutually exclusive. Is your friend correct? Explain. I don't know why your friend can make that conclusion at all. I don't know why your friend can make that conclusion at all. Uh, is your friend correct? Explain. No. 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 I don't know how to explain this. There's just not enough. What about the possibility of a red two? Wait, hold on. What'd they say? Red cards and even numbers much, must be... Yeah. What? So mutually exclusive means that there's no possibility of a red even. Or that um, red cards and even numbers mutually exclusive. Yeah, if a red occurs, then even can occur. I don't know why just because two red cards were odd doesn't mean that all red cards are odd. I don't even know what to say about this thing. I'm um, kind of confused. <laughs> so, no. Yeah, I don't know what your friend's saying there. Um, it's possible, right? Not until all cards are drawn could we make such a conclusion. I don't know. Could we arrive at such a conclusion? It's possible. We can make the conjecture. We, we have, like, proven it, though, so there's that. Uh, I hope I answered that one, that last one correctly. I, I, I don't know. It was just kind of an interesting question. I thought we were going to do some calculations. All right, guys, that'll do it for this one. This is Mr. Robinson. Thank you so much for watching. At least this one was shorter than the other ones. All the, there are times I stammer and struggle through some of the things, the probability. That time one was, uh, was a doozy for me for a second. But, uh, guys, we have two more sections to go in this chapter for this. So, take care. I will see you in any of those next ones.